Good day and God bless. Hi, I'm Pastor Brian. I'm a creator's kid and you are too. Welcome once again to the Monday Night Class here on the Unalienable Program. Well, tonight we're following up to last week's special treat with part two of The Name. It's a program from the originator of the Monday Night Class Patriot Movement Program, Jack Smith, a man who I listened to for the last two to three years of his uh, career. Uh, he'd been going on for decades in, in the movement and uh, was an inspiration to many. Uh, and tonight we're uh, presenting part two of uh, the program that we started last week. They were actually two separate download programs. Uh, they came every week and I subscribed and I used to wait each week for them to be downloaded through the email and then I'd listen to them. Well, this is another excerpt from one of his programs. Uh, I did cut out some of the contact information and some of the other miscellaneous information in the show to feature on the main topic of the program, basically the name, your name, the name, the person's name, the corporation's name. What is in a name basically is a document that he's sharing some very valuable information. So, I decided I'd go ahead and uh, do this two-part episode from Jack Smith, and then we'll get back to sharing some other information here, too. But if you'd like this program, if you'd like to hear more of Jack Smith, I have a little more than two years' worth of his programs in my Freedom Info Pack. You can find that at our website, www unalienable.online. Just go to the Freedom Info Pack page, make any kind of donation there, and then you can download all of the Freedom Info Pack files. So, oh, and once more, when you listen to the programs um, from the from those files, uh, please don't contact them. Um, Jack is uh, deceased. He passed away back in 2019. So the phone number and the email won't be answered anymore. Nevertheless, he lives. He lives in our memories and in our inspirations. And that's one of the main reasons why I started this Monday Night Class program, to help us keep on learning uh, in the way that he worked so hard to teach. So Without any further waste of time, you thought I was going to say further ado, didn't you? Here is Jack Smith with his Monday night class. Okay, good evening. Here with Jack, the Monday night class. Uh, today is the 21st. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to meet here this evening. Please open up our minds and our hearts to this law because all of the law is your law. We ask this through our, your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, Jack, any announcements? Okay, this is a notice for the Monday night class. The Monday night class audio downloads, here and after downloads, are the private exchange of ideas and concepts between the providers and the recipients. The content is not meant as legal advice. The use or attempted use of any idea or procedure discussed in the downloads as applied to the recipient's own personal transactions, case, or controversy, or applied to any other cases may or may not result in a favorable outcome of the same or the same outcome is discussed in the downloads. Each transaction, case, or controversy may be different as a result of unique actions or unique statements made by the parties therein. And each different act or statement in any transaction affects or may affect whether any procedure or idea discussed in the downloads 
is relevant to your transaction or that the outcome thereof will be depicted in the downloads, be as depicted in the downloads. The discussion of ideas or procedures in the downloads is not exhaustive of the subject being discussed in any one download. Many ideas and concepts that can affect the outcome of any legal or commercial procedures are not discussed in any one download, and the fact that you may not be aware of these issues may have an adverse effect on the outcome of your procedure. It is the responsibility of each party to understand his own transactions and to apply the appropriate and complete concepts necessary for a procedure and substantive remedy thereto. Okay, last time we got together here, we were talking about uh, names and what's in a name, and we're going to continue on that. And last time we were together, I was also talking about this woman with this unregistered church that was having some uh, legal issues with a uh, municipality that was charging her with crimes involving the fact that some of the people in the church were using uh, peyote and also cannabis, which, you know, a lot of states sometimes allow, but the Fed government's still not into it, and some of the states still aren't into it, and of course, uh, she wanted to try to do whatever she could to minimize the criminal actions, and so we were giving her some suggestions. I've got some updates and stuff a little bit on that, too. The key thing that I want to emphasize, and if you go back to the February 7th uh, night where we were doing an explanation of that is, many times you can do a piece of paperwork or something like that for your case, but unless you understand and know what the value is in that paperwork and how to react in terms of what you say and what you do, your acts and actions. Sometimes your paperwork has no value whatsoever to you. It's not that the paperwork is going to be the silver bullet and going to get somebody out of trouble. The paperwork is like the card that you give to somebody when you introduce yourself. But you have to know how to work that process in order to get the results. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that also tonight here. Okay, we were studying what's in a name. And when we were studying what's in a name, what was interesting is as we were going through this, I was relating back to other issues that are going on with people that we're dealing with and helping to try to get you to understand that on a textbook level you can understand what's in a name and think you know what's going on. But when it comes to the rubber meeting the road, when you're dealing with public officials or legal cases or whatever it is you're dealing with, you have to fully understand that you need to couple your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding with good procedure so that you don't undo everything you're trying to accomplish by what you say or how you act. And so let's go through a little bit more. It says in Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, page 2574, we find... Quote, person, a man considered according to the rank he holds in society, with all the right to which the place he holds entitles him, and the duty which it imposes. It may include artificial beings, such as corporations, territorial corps, foreign corps relating to taxation and revenue laws, 14th Amendment persons, a slave, the estate of a decedent, a judge holding court, an infant, ward of the court, officers, partnerships, women, participates in forbidden acts, defendants and plaintiffs, agents, officers, and members of the board of directors or trustees or their controlling bodies of corporations. The legal support, subject matter, or subs. It is therefore factual to say that persons throughout the history of our common language has meant a number of things, including a government-created fiction, which is an artificial subject to the public laws, public utility, or public function. Current attacks by the prosecutors of the public law, public servants, are commenced in the name of fictions, 
which is a persona, a person, a whoever, and etc. And by supreme and binding declaration in the United States Supreme Court at Dred Scott, we have learned that absolute immunity is dictated where a procedurally proper and lawful contract is lacking even in the case of a state-created fiction. So, as corporate juris secundum are the widely recognized initials, that's CJS of corpus juris secundum, according to the body of law, this is the embodiment of the public law. It is from this that we can be identified. It is now factual to say, pursuant to the United States Supreme Court, the body of public law, our common language, etc., that a sovereign is not a person. A person has a name, and therefore a sovereign has not an all capital acronymical abbreviation name, which is public. Section 64 of 57 Amger Second identifies the fact that fictitious names are in use. The next several sections of 57 Amger Second deal with the use of an assumed or fictitious name and how the law deals with a man, woman, or person using a fictitious name. These sections, sections 64 through 79, set forth that generally a fictitious name identifies an artificial entity. Let's go off the text here for a minute. We've read before in our Monday night sessions that since the government is presumed to be a corporation, which itself is a fiction, the government can only deal with other fictions. What they just said here is, the law describes the fact that many or most names apply to fictions. Therefore, it would seem appropriate that whenever an officer of the law or a government agency comes at you, they're going to drop a name on you, either on the paper or verbally. And the presumption is, since it's a government agent, or agency doing it, the name that they drop is going to be the name of a fiction because that's the only one they can deal with. So when the government comes at you and drops a name, if you respond to that name, you have just identified yourself by confession as a fiction subject to the authority of that government agent or agency and you've just volunteered into the trap. In Scripture, Moses said to God at the burning bush, you've asked me to go talk to the government of Egypt, and you've asked me to go see your people who are slaves in Egypt. When I get there, by what name shall I say you sent me? And God at the burning bush basically suggested you aren't going to get me into that name trap because if I give a name and it's presumed to be an artificial entity then everybody's going to assume that they have as much power or authority over me that I actually have over them because they're my creation not the other way around so don't give him, give them any specific name just say I am sent me and you will convey no power to them as it originates in me. I will not covenant and contract with these people. The text goes on here, item sonance. As we pursue this line of logic, we need to address item sonance. Its definition can be found in 14 CJS under names, page 36, subprene in general. Quote, if names sound alike, they are usually regarded as the same although spelled differently. And the variance in their spelling is considered immaterial. Unquote. With respect to names, the phrase item sonans means of the same sound. The general rule is that the law public does not regard the spelling of names as much as it does their sound. Great latitude is allowed in the pronunciation and spelling of proper names, since proper names are often spelled differently although pronounced the same. For instance, Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, and Terry, T-E-R-R-I, are pronounced the same but spelled differently. Quote, 
if they sound alike or even if common usage, widely known, has made their pronunciation identical, they are regarded as the same. And a variance in their spelling is immaterial unless it is such as misleads a person to his prejudice or the misspelling transforms the name into a wholly distinct appellation, unquote. So when the judge in court or the clerk in court or the bailiff calls out, Jack Smith, and you stand up, under item Sonin's, you've just taken on the name of the artificial person fiction, because that's the name they called out in court. And if you say, well, I don't care, I don't spell my name with all caps, it don't make any difference. You've already entered the jurisdiction. He goes on. Same sounding names discussed above are like Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, Terry, T-E-R-R-I, or capital T, capital E, capital R, capital R, capital Y, as the later is not a proper name, but an abbreviation, an acronym, an initialism. So what is J capital J, capital O, capital H, capital N? What is John? It could be a corporation, a vessel, a computer term, etc. It is not widely net recognized or known, and therefore, according to the Government Printing Office publication on style, it is an improper ab uh, abbreviation. This is nothing other than an appearance of a legitimacy, a legal. The exception clause of the item Sonens test must be invoked, i.e., quote, unless it is such to mislead a person to his prejudice, or the misspelling transforms the name into a wholly distinct appellation, unquote. This is truly a wholly distinct appellation, as official sources of references and information do not identify, describe, or define capital J, capital O, capital H, capital N. The Manual on Usage and Style, 8th edition. Always capitalize proper nouns independent of the context in which they are used. Refer to specific persons, places, and things. But that's just capitalize the first letter. <coughs> that's under paragraph D32 of section D in that Stiles Manual. Quote, capitalize people, state, and any other terms used to refer to the government as a litigant. For instance, the people's case, you have a capital P in people's. The state's argument, you have a capital S in states. But we do not capitalize other words used to refer to litigants. The plaintiff is a lowercase p. Defendant is a lowercase d. The New Oxford Dictionary of English is published by the Oxford Universe Pre University Press. Besides being considered the foremost authority on the British English language, this dictionary is also designed to reflect the way it is used today through example sentences and phrases. We submit the following definitions from the 1998 edition. Proper noun, also proper name. Now, a name used for an individual, person, place, organization, spelled with an initial capital letter, e.g. E Jane with a capital J, London with a capital L, and Oxfam with a capital O. Name, noun, one. A word or set of words by which a person, animal, place, or thing is known, addressed, or referred to. My name is Parsons, with a capital P. John Parsons, capital J, capital P. Kalkwasser, capital K, is the German name for lime water. Verb, two, identify by name. Give the correct name for the dead man has been named as John, capital J for John or a Macintosh, capital M. Phrases, three, in the name of, bearing or using the name of a, a specified person or organization. For instance, a driver's license in the name of William Saunders, capital W, capital S. From the Newberry House Dictionary of American English, published by Monroe Allen Publishers, Inc., 1999. Name, a noun. A word by which a person, place, or thing is known. Her name is Diane Daniel, capital D, capital D. We can find absolutely no example in any recognized reference book that specifically 
uh, that specifies or allows the use of all capital names, proper or common. There is no doubt that a proper name, to be grammatically correct, must be written with only the first letter capitalized, with the remainder of the word in the name spelled with lowercase letters. Section 6, the U.S. Government Style Manual. Is the spelling and using usage of a proper name defined officially by the U.S. government? Yes. The United States Government Printing Office in their Style Manual, March 1984 edition, the most recent edition published as of March 2000, provides comprehensive grammar, style, and usage for all government publications, including court and legal writing. Chapter 3, Capitalization. At Section 3.2 prescribes rules for proper names. Quote, proper names are capitalized. Examples given are Rome, capital R, Brussels, capital B, John McAdam, capital J, capital M, McAdam Family, capital M, lower F for family, Italy, capital I, Anglo-Saxon, capital A, and capital S. At Chapter 17, Court Work, the rules of capitalization, as mentioned in Chapter 3, are fur further reiterated. 17.1, court work differs in style from other work only as set forth in this section. Otherwise, the style prescribed in the preceding section will be followed. After reading section 17 in entirety, I found no other reference that would change the grammatical rules and styles reflected in chapter 3 pertaining to capitalization. As section 17.9, the same official U.S. government manual states, quote, In the title of cases, the first letter of all printed words are capitalized, but not such terms as defendant with a lower D and appellee with a lower A. This wholly agrees with the Texas Law Reviews Manual on Usage and Style as referenced above. Examples showed in section 17.12 are also consistent with the aforementioned section 17.9 specification. That is all, proper names are to be spelled with capital first letters and the balance each spelled with lower case letters. Section 7, Grammar, Punctuation, and Capitalization. Quote, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, has published one of the most concise U.S. government resources on capitalization, NASA publication SP-7084, Grammar, Punctuation, and Capitalization. A handbook for technical writers and editors was compiled and written by the NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia at Chapter 4, Capitalization. They state in 4.1 Introduction, quote, First, we should define terms used when re discussing capitalization. All caps means that every letter in an expression is capital comma like this. Well, it's capital L, capital I, capital K, capital E space, capital T, capital H, capital I, capital S. Caps and lower case means that the principal words of an expression are capitalized like this. And then they show that the first word in the sentence has a cap, and then everything else in the sentence has lowercase, with capital letters instead of lowercase letters. Elements in a document, such as headings, titles, and captions, may be capitalized in either sentence style or headline style. Sentence style calls for capitalization of the first letter in proper nouns, of course. Headline style calls for capitalization of all principal words, also called caps and lowercase. Modern publishers tend toward a down style of capitalization, that is, toward use of fewer capitals rather than an up style. Here we see that in headlines, titles, captions, and in sentences, there is no authorized usage of all caps. At 4.4.1, Capitalization with Acronyms, we find that the first authoritative use for all caps, quote, acronyms are always formed with capital letters. Acronyms are often coined for a particular program or study and therefore require definition. The letters of the acronyms are not capitalized in the definition unless 
the acronym stands for a proper name. Wrong. The best electronic publishing systems combine what you see is what you get, and then they abbreviate that with all capitals W-Y-S-I-W-Y-G, features. That's wrong. Correct. The best electronic publication system combine what you see is what you get, and in that case, they have the W-Y-S-I-W-Y-C. Again, they're all caps. But Langley is involved with the National Aerospace Program, which then they would abbreviate that by a capital N, capital A, capital S, capital P, and then program is a capital P on it, but lowercase beyond that. This cites by example that using all caps is allowable in an acronym. Acronyms are words formed from the initial letters of successive parts of a term. They never contain periods and are often um, not standard, so that definition is required. Could this apply to lawful, proper Christian names? Is that, if that were true, then John Smith, all capital J-O-H-N, S-M-I-T-H, would have to follow a definition of some sort, which it does not. For example, only if John Smith, all caps, were defined as John Orley Holistic Nutrition and the Smith Medical Institute of Holistics, would the all capital letter John Smith be accurate? The most significant section appears in 4.5, Administrative Names. Quote, official designation of political divisions and of other organized bodies are capitalized. For instance, names of political divisions. For instance, Canada, comma, New York State, or United States Northwest Territories, or Virgin Islands, comma, Ontario Province. But they're all upper and lower case except for just the first letter of each word. Names of government units, U.S. Government Executive Department, U.S. Congress, U.S. Army, U.S. Navy. According to this official U.S. government publication, the states are never to be spelled in all caps, such as New York State, where it's all capital letters. The, publish, the proper English grammar and legal style is New York State, capital N on New, capital Y on York, and capital S on State. This agrees once again with Ohio, which is a capital O. Section 8, the use of a legal fiction, the real-life dictionary of the law. The authors of, quote, the real-life dictionary of the law, unquote, Gerald and Kathleen Hill are accomplished scholars and writers. Gerald Hill is an experienced attorney, judge, and law instructor. Here is how the term legal fiction is described. Quote, legal fiction. Now, a presumption of fact assumed by a court for convenience, consistency, or to achieve justice. There is an old adage, fictions arise from the law, but not law from fictions, unquote. So did you get that? Legal fictions are there assumed by the court. Assumed. Which means it's a presumption. And under the rules of evidence, unless you rebut that immediately, it stands, okay? And it's there for convenience. Ooh, theirs or yours. Consistency or to achieve justice. Oh, we want to achieve justice because we look at your status in standing as a slave and you're not entitled to rights, so we're going to reference you as a legal fiction so that we have authority to administer justice over you because you have no capacity to conduct your own life in a competent style. That's what they're telling you. From Oren's Dictionary of the Law, published by West Group 1999, within the definition of fiction is found, quote, A legal fiction is an assumption that something that is or may be false or non-existent is true or real. Legal fictions are assumed or invented to help do justice. For example, bringing a lawsuit to throw a non-existent John Doe off your property used to be the only way to establish a clear white to the property when legal title was uncertain. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary of Law. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary Law, 1996, states, quote, 
legal fiction. Something assumed in law to be fact irrespective of the truth or accuracy of that assumption. Example, the legal fiction that a day has no fractions. The main key to a legal fiction is assumption as noted in each definition above. Assumption of a legal fiction. An important issue concerning this entire matter is whether or not a proper name perverted into an all-caps assemblage of letters can be substituted for a lawful Christian name or any proper name such as, quote, State of Florida, where it's a capital S and a capital F. Is the assertion of an all-capital name letter names legal? If so, from where does this practice originate and what enforces it? A legal fiction may be employed when the name of a person is not known, and therefore using the fictitious name John Doe as a tentative or interim artifice to surmount the absence of true knowledge until the true name is known. Upon discovering the identity of the fictitious name, the true name replaces it. In all cases, a legal fiction is an assumption of purported, purported facts without having shown the fact to be true or valid. It is an acceptance with no proof. An established maxim of law states the importance of the name. In the maxim is, in order rightly to comprehend a thing, inquire first into the names, for a right knowledge of things depends upon their names. Conclusion. Commercial law deals with people engaged in commerce and fictitious entities, persons, artificial persons. The documents creating them, such as articles of incorporation and bylaws, such as trust indentures, documents of ownership or control, certificates of title, birth certificates, etc., and contracts involving the same. Such persons are identified with names in all capital letters and in such legal terms as citizen, driver, officer of a corporation, etc. These persons cannot be seen, touched, or heard. Law is extremely precise. Every letter, capitalization, punctuation mark, etc. in a legal document is utilized for a specific reason and has legal, i.e. deadly force, consequences. If, for instance, one attacks, attempts to attach articles of incorporation to the office of a secretary of state of a state, if the exact title of the corporation down to every jot and title is not exactly the same each and every time the corporation is referenced in the documents to be filed, the Secretary of State will refuse to file the papers. This is because each time the name of the corporation is referenced, it must be set forth identically in order to express the same legal entity. The tiniest difference in the name of the corporation changes its legal identity. Why is, quote, the state of Texas, unquote, or, quote, John Doe, unquote, not used in the courts or on driver's licenses where they're upper and lower case? What stops them from doing this? Obviously, there is a reason for using the all caps name, since they are very capable of writing proper names, just as their own official style manual states. The reason behind legal fictions is found within the definitions as cited above. Title III, Pleadings and Motions, Rule 9A, Capacity, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure states, in pertinent part, when an issue is raised as to the legal existence of a named party or the party's capacity to be sued, or the authority of a party to be sued, the party desiring to raise the issue shall do so by specific negative averment which shall include supporting particulars. At this junction, it is clear that the existence of a name written with all caps is a necessity created legal fiction. This is surely an issue to be raised and the supporting particulars are outlined within this memorandum. Use of the proper name must be insisted upon as a matter of abatement. Corrections for all parties of an action of purported law. However, the current courts cannot correct this 
since they are all based on presumed assumed fictional law and must use artificial juristic names. Instead, they expect parties to accept the all-cap names and agree by silence to accept the fictional entity. They must go to unlimited lengths to deceive and coerce this compliance. Automated computer systems with daisy wheels and pin printers used pervasively in the early 1980s emulated the IBM Electrix typewriter, courier, or Helvetica fonts in both upper and lower case letters. Shortly thereafter, the introduction of laser and inkjet printers with multiple fonts became the standard. For the past 15 years, there is no excuse that the government computers will not accommodate the use of lowercase letters unless the older data is still stored in its original form, i.e. all caps, and has not been translated due to the cost of reentry. But this does not excuse the entry of new data, only legacy data. In fact, on many government forms today, proper names are in all caps, while other areas of the same computer produce documents that are both upper and lower case. One can only conclude that now, more than ever, the use of all caps is substitution. In substitution, the writing of proper name is no mistake. There are no official or unofficial English grammar style manuals or reference publications that recognize the use of all cap when writing a proper name. To do so is by fiat within and out of an undisclosed jurisdiction by unknown people for unrevealed reasons, by juristic license of arbitrary presumptions not based on facts. The authors of the process unilaterally create legal fictions for their own reasons. The U.S. and state governments are deliberately using a legal fiction to address the lawful, real flesh and blood man or woman on their own shelves. It is clear this is deliberate because their own official publications state that proper names are not to be written in all caps. They are deliberately not following their own recognized authorities. In the same respect, the identifying their own government entity in all caps, they are legally stating that it is also intended to be a legal fiction. As stated in the beginning of this memorandum, the use of all caps for writing a proper name is an internal style for what is apparently a predetermined usage and at this point unknown justification. The admission, the omission of the Christian name by either plaintiff or defendant in a legal process prevents the court from acquiring jurisdiction. Bouvier's Law Jurisdiction, 8th edition, page 2287. Did you hear what I just read out of Bouvier's Law? The omission of the Christian name by either plaintiff or defendant in a legal process prevents the court from acquiring jurisdiction. That's out of Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 8th edition. There is a way to use this when you have to go to court, and I will get into that later, Dr. Weatherly. On another very important subject, let me add something. Most people don't understand this, but God was in Christ paying for all our sins on the cross and is over and done and finished, and he's not angry, and he's not angry with us about anything anymore. The Bible says he is for us, not against us. He died in our place to purchase us for himself. And if you'll give in to him, there's nothing he won't be able to do in your life. I know I have been with him for 37 years. And when he finally leaves us, and when we finally leave this world, we'll live with him forever if we belong to him. If we need to think about that or, or have someone in mind that does, I'll be glad to talk with them. And then Dr. Weatherly gives his number, 662-489-6554. I just wanted you to know that. Okay, there's been a bit of chatter here about names and capitalization, so I'll pass along as food for thought. From Black's Fourth, Capitus Diminuo to, in Roman law, a diminishing or abridgment of personality, a loss or containment of a man's status or aggregate of legal attributes and qualifications.
Then he, that's basically about the end of this particular write-up of the document, what is in a name. So we're out of time for tonight. Next week we will probably be getting back more into our line of studies so that we will be able to perfect our status and standing and go on with all of the other positive things that we believe are happening in our society and in our universe right now. Everybody have a good week. God willing, we'll see you back here next week. And there you go. Another episode of the Monday Night Class featuring the originator of it, Mr. Jack Smith. I hope you really enjoyed it. Once again, you can receive more of his programs through our website, unalienable.online, at the Freedom Info Pack page. Just make any donation and you can download the files uh, by clicking on the link. So, once again, um, we'll be back every Monday night if I'm able to do it and share as much as I can with you. If you have any suggestions of what topics or documents you'd like to learn about here in the Monday night class, please drop me a line at Pastor Brian at unalienable.online. Otherwise, uh, I look forward to seeing you here every Monday night or whenever you get to see this program. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Pastor Brian. I'm a creator's kid, and you are too. God bless.